three quarters of our planet is covered in water. The great oceans are sparsely populated, equivalent to huge deserts. Creatures of the deep must travel far in search of food. But here and there, submerged mountain peaks break through the waves. Remote islands in a desert sea. Ocean oases. Constantly shrouded in mist and cloud, Cocos Island is remote and uninhabited. Its steep cliffs rise hundreds of feet from the East Pacific Ocean. There are over 200 waterfalls, fed by more than 24 feet of rain a year. One thing there's no shortage of on this small island is fresh water. The combination of the climate, the rugged terrain and its isolation has preserved its forests and vegetation. A haphazard collection of plants which reached Cocos across the open sea, carried on the winds, on ocean currents and in the feathers and droppings of migratory birds. This miniature oasis of life supports over 400 species of plants, many unique to the island. With its never-failing fresh water, fish and fruit, Cocos has long been a favourite port of call for mariners. The only sheltered anchorage is in Chatham Bay, but even here the shoreline is littered with rocks and boulders. Nowadays, Costa Rican fishing boats 300 miles from the nearest land stop by for fresh water. And on the granite boulders, the island's written history. The names of men who were shipwrecked here, or just passing by en route to Panama, the Galapagos Islands, or beyond. More recently, people have come to Cocos to discover the rich underwater life. The unpolluted waters surrounding Cocos are the ideal habitat for a wide variety of species. This tiny island, five miles long by two miles wide, is also a magnet for ocean fish, drawn to the abundant food supplies around its rocky walls. Top of the food chain are the resident white-tip sharks. Near the sunlit surface glide manta rays. Stingrays patrol the rocky bottom. But this wealth of life has only been discovered in recent years. For centuries, the Cocos treasure was of a strictly material kind. On a 17th century pirate's map, Cocos is shown far larger than it should be, a sure sign of its importance to buccaneers preying on ships laden with gold, silver and jewels from Spain's South American colonies. Over the years, priceless treasures have been buried on the island. One of the richest single hoards was the Lima treasure. In 1821, Lima, the capital of Spanish-occupied Peru, was under attack by rebel forces. To stop the contents of the mint and the vast wealth of the churches falling into rebel hands, a British merchant ship, the Mary Deer, was commissioned to take this treasure out to sea for safekeeping. But within 24 hours, the Scottish captain, William Thompson, and his crew had turned pirate. They murdered two priests and the guards, then set course for Cocos, over 1,300 miles to the northeast. It's believed they buried the treasure near Wafer Bay, planning to return for it later on. But there's no record they or anyone else recovered it. Now worth many millions of dollars, the Lima treasure still lies hidden somewhere on Cocos. In the 1940s, Jimmy Forbes, who believed that the first mate of the Mary Deer had been his great-grandfather, came across maps and documents relating to the treasure. 
but despite six expeditions in search of it, he found nothing. Other treasure maps have appeared, some very detailed, leading people to finance futile expeditions. Many lost fortunes in their search for the hidden wealth. Others lost their lives. Two French divers were eaten by sharks while investigating an underwater cave near Manuelita Island, the protruding tip of an underwater mountain and a magnet for the food-rich currents that well up from the deep ocean. This endless supply of plankton attracts an ascending order of predators, and at the top are the sharks. White tips spend most of the day sleeping on the bottom. At dusk, they come awake, teaming up with hundreds of others, forming hunting packs. There are so many sharks here at Cocos that they have to share living space. This one lives with some marbled stingrays, whose camouflage markings make them look like the granite rocks. Sharks' eyes can make the most of very little light. However, the majority of them pinpoint their prey by scent alone. The shark patrol at dusk at Manuelita is an impressive sight, with up to 500 on the lookout for a meal. They prefer slower moving creatures like octopus. They're night feeders too. And that's why there are not a lot of octopus around Cocos. If they're cornered, they have no defense against a white tip, let alone a hungry pack. When the sharks find one, they all crowd in, hoping for a share. Blue jacks hang around in case there are any leftovers. There are about a thousand white tips around Cocos Island, a sign that these unpolluted waters support a well-stocked larder. It's probably because this island lies so far offshore and is uninhabited that this dense underwater population survives. Out of the hundreds of species here at Cocos, many have developed ways to help them survive. The markings on these leather bass help them blend in with the granite boulders. Fully grown, they're nearly a meter long and can weigh over 15 kilos. The rocky crevices provide good shelter for the younger fish. This juvenile will have reached maturity when it finally loses the yellow coloration on its fins. Spiny urchins make an ideal nursery for a baby leather bass, only a few centimeters long. They're also the refuge for other small fish. Down here, it's like an overpopulated city. A stingray shares a hole with a moray eel. The eel opens and closes its mouth to gulp in water and pumps it over its gills to get oxygen. At the entrance to a crayfish's home, Moorish idols feed on algae borne by the currents. Protection from predators is vital to survival. Crayfish rely on their hard outer shell and jet propulsion. The filefish puts its trust in a tough, leathery skin. It also confuses predators with its broken stripes. Spots are a powerful keep-off sign, and they're liberally sprinkled over the tiny box fish. Pufferfish have poisonous skin. 
This young one is losing its yellow coat, just beginning to reveal the adult spots beneath. It'll be several weeks before it looks like this. Leopard-like markings are only part of the spotted burrfish's defense. It can also inflate itself to five times its size. At this ocean oasis, some of the usual rules don't seem to apply. A burrfish, usually a loner, is apparently enjoying the company of a pipefish and a juvenile leather bass. We can only guess at why these three different species have got together. Another peculiarity of Cocos, the rare red-lipped batfish. It lives on the seabed in deep water. Like most bottom dwellers, it's shaped and camouflaged to make it invisible. Until it moves, it blends almost perfectly with the sandy floor. Its short, stumpy pectoral fins have almost become legs. Another miniature monster the frogfish. It moves about the rocky walls using its fins as rudders in the current. It's a type of anglerfish, spending most of the time waiting for an unsuspecting creature to be deceived by the lure poised just above its capacious jaws. To help it stay put, its pectoral fins have become more like hands. It's not only very small fish that need to be wary. The frogfish's mouth can expand to 14 times its normal size. From the deep, dark waters of the north side to the sunlit shallows of the south. In Bay Iglesias is a submerged rock its tip only a few meters below the surface. Its sunlit waters and strong currents are ideal for the resident fish from the top all the way down to the bottom at this underwater high rise. A filefish rides the current, trimming its flight with its fins. Large numbers of other fish patrol the waters, rich in plankton and microscopic algae. A hogfish searches the barnacle-encrusted rocks, followed by a striped surgeonfish. A blue demoiselle darts out of its home. Hogfish are very territorial and will chase off any rivals. An angelfish stays put, guarded by a sea urchin. A male emperorfish, guarding eggs, it won't move from its nest until they are hatched. Strong jaws and blunt teeth are essential for grinding up small shellfish. A combination of unpolluted waters and strong currents supports a population from white-tipped sharks at the top of the food chain right down to the smallest fish at the bottom. Sharks don't have to swim continuously to keep water flowing through their gills. Halfway down submerged rock, they rest in their caves and let the currents do it for them. 25 meters down at the base is an archway, and here it's always busy. Shoals of yellow striped snapper hide in the crevices, darting up to feed. But they might become a meal themselves for fish like giant trevally, which use the fast current to gain extra speed. They herd their prey into smaller and smaller circles before attacking. Fish group together in shoals close to the rock face. There's safety in numbers. 
From a distance, they could be seen as one large creature, rather than a mass of individual ones. Around here are some of Cocos Island's strongest currents, powerful enough to send a diver into a spin. These currents sweep in from the deep ocean. Without the plankton they bring, none of this diverse and interdependent population could survive. Barely breaking the surface, shark fin rock attracts some of the most graceful and elegant of fish. Small manta rays, known as mobulas. Mobulas are only one or two meters across, compared to the eight meters or more of the giant Pacific mantas. Their broad backs make them ideal hosts to remoras, fish which attach themselves by suckers to rays and mop up any food particles which happen to float by. They also clean their hosts of external parasites. The manta family of rays are sometimes called devilfish because of the horn-like fins on either side of the head. In fact, they're harmless, mainly plankton-eating creatures without even a sting in their tail. Among the many deep sea visitors to Cocos are the ocean's gentle giants, whale sharks, the largest living fish. Even though they can grow up to 15 meters long and weigh as much as 20 tons, whale sharks live almost entirely on plankton. They sieve it from the water by a system of cartilaginous bars inside their gills. They're harmless to man, but they do have teeth and can take tuna and squid, as well as smaller fish. Plankton, those tiny blobs of living matter that drift with the currents, attract fish as well as whale sharks. The fish, in turn, then attract the predators. Among them, one of the strangest of sharks. The hammerhead. These are scalloped hammerheads, which can reach nearly five meters long. They're not usually seen in such large numbers. They prefer the deeper, colder water away from Cocos. But when conditions are right, they come in to feed. Poor visibility doesn't matter. Their heads are packed with special receptors, which pick up bioelectricity from their favorite prey, stingrays. They also feed on fish, squid, and other sharks. And they're prone to cannibalism. Moray eels are not, though there's always an exception to every rule. Being very territorial, they don't take kindly to intruders. hard face of survival. At Cocos Island, like anywhere else in the ocean, life is a matter of eat 
or be eaten. In open water, an unlikely alliance. Sharks, dolphins and rainbow runners have herded a shoal of snapper into a tight ball. There's no escape. The snapper on the outside are continually trying to hide in the middle, but it's no safer there. It's not unusual for predators to herd small fish into a bait ball, but it's rarely seen as close as this. Attracted by the turmoil on the surface, boobies dive for their share, while blacktip and silky sharks conduct the attack from below, joined by rainbow runners. Once the shoal has bunched together, all the sharks have to do is dart in and take their pick. Despite the frenzy, bottlenose dolphins seem uninterested. In the open ocean, there are few places to hide from predators. But at Dos Amigos Arch, stingrays take cover. The arch is 30 meters from top to bottom, and the cracks and crevices provide shelter for shoals of fish. These rays are known as marbled rays because of the camouflage granite-like pattern on their backs. At the entrance to the arch, yellow-tail snapper stay close, ready to take cover in the rocks. And a solitary jack seeks protection under a large ray. There's perhaps one predator that can upset this delicate balance of nature, and that's man. In the early 1990s, illegal fishing threatened to decimate Cocos's entire underwater population. Fish stocks declined, and with no control, all species were under threat. The Costa Rican government recognized the importance of Cocos and introduced a 15-mile fishing limit around the island and designated it a national park. Since then, the fish population has made a dramatic recovery. Cocos is a typical ocean oasis, small, isolated, and a magnet for all creatures that live in the surrounding sea. In the open ocean, prey may be hard to find for the larger species. But where rocks break the surface, the currents accelerate and well up in the shallower water. They sweep in plankton and algae, which in turn attract fish in their thousands. The ocean's giants also cruise in from the deep to feed.
a complete chain of life from microscopic organisms to the great oceanic predators that could not exist without these oases of land. In the surf line, under Cocos's towering cliffs, Trevally jacks hunt in shoals, looking for small fish to feed on. Surgeon fish are herbivores. They too like to be near the surface, where sunlight produces algae. They've developed a long snout to help scrape it from the barnacle-encrusted rocks. There's food for all at Cocos. This tiny island supports over 400 marine species, a wealth of life to be explored. The undisputed treasures of Cocos Island still survive and are easily found in the surrounding waters of this unique treasure island.